let me just jump right into the word. And um, I, Paul said to Timothy, wrote to Timothy, he said, I left you in Ephesus uh, that you might charge, that you might command some that they teach no other doctrine. And so early on in our Christian faith, we had people who were trying to teach various things. Um, I think that it is a terrible thing to just be all over the board. And I know some Christians are, are accustomed to that. And you don't see any, anything wrong with it. I do. And uh, I, my mind goes back to one of our, our pastors on staff several years ago was telling me a, a story. I thought it was quite funny. He said, uh, you know, when we were not doing very well, we bought uh, our boys uh, those McDonald chicken nuggets. That's all we, we could afford. So they had those specials. We'd buy them and they were eating them. And when we got a little money, we, we went and bought just the, the, the chicken breast chicken nuggets and they wouldn't eat them. So they'd gotten so accustomed to bad food. So that's how, how sometimes we are as Christians. We are so accustomed to eating everywhere. I've asked you, don't just eat at any table. Uh, and I learned that as a child growing up. We were really, I didn't know it at the time, but we were kind of bratty. Uh, I didn't realize it, but we were spoiled on our mother's food. Mom was not only a great cook, but she was so particular in the kitchen, we knew we could trust whatever she produced. And I mean, she didn't blow her nose and sell cooking or whatever, as it were. You know, she didn't scratch her head and, and just keep cooking. I mean, mom went to the wash place. And I mean, so I, I could trust her. And uh, you don't want to eat at any table. So we, we went out, when we would have church dinners, we would, we would only go to our mother's food. We wanted our mother's food and one maybe two trusted people. And so uh, I think that you want to be careful just eating anywhere. And Christianity has become a, a place where we just kind of buffet anywhere. And I would like for us to be drawn back, as, and this is not new to you, but I'd like for us to be drawn back to the centrality of Christ and his cross. Who he is as a person and what he has done. What, what is his work? And how does that affect you? Uh, now, if you've come, come here for a while, you know I'm going to teach uh, about this same man every time you see me. It doesn't matter what I'm teaching. I'm going to show you something in this man uh, uh, that we need because what Christ has done, he has done for us what nobody else could do. We know that. We know that Adam, as it were, started a fire in his own house with all of us in it. He was burning it down. And, and there was no way he could put it out. Have you ever been a little boy, a little child, and you did something that you needed mom and dad to come in and rescue you because what your mess was bigger than your ability to, to, to fix it? You know, and so that's what Adam did. He made a mess. And you may be sitting here today, uh, as it were, far removed from that. But Adam started a mess that you can't fix and I can't fix. But Christ can fix it because Christ is the solution for every problem. I would like to start by just showing you in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Paul says to us, for it pleased the Father that in him, in Christ, all the fullness should dwell. Now that in itself should tell you that you need this person. I have a good friend who grew up Muslim. And uh, maybe there are some Muslims here. And if, there are, if you are, I'm glad you're here. Uh, he grew up Muslim. And he said he read in the Quran uh, that Jesus Christ uh, was going to judge the world. He thought, if Jesus Christ is going to judge the world, then why am I here? I need to go over there. And uh, he is now a mighty uh, Christian pastor. Uh, you know, because when we read here, it pleased the Father that in this one man should all the, the fullness, that is fullness of the Godhead, all the power, all the authority of the Godhead would dwell in this man, in this human, uh, who was a human being as it were. He was a 100% man and 100% God. And this one man walking the earth was, was all God, had as it were, all the power of God in his being. So Paul says in verse 20, and by him, by that one man, not two or three, to reconcile all things to himself. So God says, my desire is to reconcile all things to myself. And Paul reiterates, by him, by Christ, whether things on earth or things in heaven. 
I, I like that. Now, there's not a period here in, in my text, but he says that he is using Christ or Christ is the answer to our reconciliation. Uh, God is not reconciled to us. We're reconciled to God. We're the ones who moved. And so, but Jesus Christ is the only way back to God. Now, there are those who think that there are many ways, and some of our younger people sometimes, um, and even we have been bombarded with this, there are many ways to God. These are people who don't know what they're talking about, people who have not known God, right? If, you don't, if you've never known God, you've not, you don't know who he is or what he, he brings. And so uh, they are saying that there are many ways to God. I offer to you that there is only one way. You may ask me, how do I know, since uh, their opinion is as good as mine. If we were going on opinions, I would say some opinions are right and some are wrong. If we were going on opinion, but we're not uh, moved by the opinion, we're moved by the truth. And uh, the truth is greater than an opinion or fact. And so the truth then resides in us in the person of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. So the truth resides in us and the truth is screaming out that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. He is the only being we have ever have had a history of or a record of that says he is God and man. And no other so-called deity can, can claim that, can boast that, and there are other things that cannot boast as well. Then he says, having made peace through the blood of his cross, he made peace peace uh, with God. And so we have now peace with God. I, I love that. You know, it, sometimes when you live in, in, in the West, especially in America, you can get so accustomed to everything being wonderful that you forget that there's trouble in the world. And uh, thank God for internet and for, for means by which uh, we, are, we have reports that there is trouble in the world. Living in the safety of of America is not everybody's lot. So then as a believer, I think we need to understand that we need the Lord, but sometimes we're a little bit uh, lackadaisical about that. We're a little bit uh, carefree and, and not really knowing that. But there are brothers and sisters right now as I speak whose lives are in jeopardy. Uh, as I said to you earlier, I, I read, when I read this, their account in, in um, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, maybe verse 4 or so, where Paul talked about Aquila and Priscilla, and he said they had risked their necks. I used to read that in somewhat of a casual way. I would read that, and I just thought, oh, yeah, they put their lives on the line. But they didn't just put their lives on the line. They put their very necks on the line. And we, there are places in the world today where our brothers and sisters bought by the same blood that you and I bought by. They have the same uh, profession of faith and they've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and their necks are literally on the line. So I cannot just sit here casually and I cannot be unemotional. And yes, I am emotional about it because it moves me. Paul says that Christ made peace through the blood of his cross, through the shedding of blood. And so we find in, in this, in this uh, narrative that... Uh, that Jesus Christ had to die to save us. And that's what, what is so important. He died to save us. Hello, men of Corpus Christi and the Coastal Bend. We're living in a world of great conflict and overbearing pressures. We are required to deal with these demands and at the same time, the demands of fatherhood, work, and marriage. These are sometimes overwhelming. Men and brethren, you need a friend. At the fellowship, we will introduce you to Jesus Christ, who is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm expecting to see you soon. Hello, I'm Don Lavelle, pastor of the fellowship, and this is my wife, Marva. The Bible says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious anointing oil upon the head. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon, where God commands a blessing, life forevermore. You know, when the body flows together as one unit, it really reminds me of the universe that the Lord has created, and I think that really pleases Him. Come see us this Sunday. Now, I want to talk about the blood of His cross and how that works, His finished work, because there are two things that we must talk about 
I think, in, in all of our preaching, and that is the person of Christ and the work of Christ and be affected by both of them. In Philippians chapter 3, 17 and 18, Paul says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. And so what Paul is telling us in Philippians is that, is that we need to follow good examples. And he said to them, join my example. What Paul is saying is, I am not a, a believer or a Christian in word only, but in deed. I am a Christian indeed. Now, how many of us are Christian in word only or we are, we are Christian as long as things are going our way and the moment they don't go our way, we resort to weapons that God does not agree with. That is carnal weapons, uh, fleshly weapons. But Paul says, follow my, our example, follow our example. And, and you have seen us, so note those who walk in the same manner. So Paul is telling us that we are either a good example or a bad example. And I, I want to, I want to uh, charge all of us today to be a good example, to not just to, to be good as long as things are good in your life, but when they come down to the nitty gritty and they get really bad, that you don't say, well, I'm gonna just uh, lay my, my belief down for a while while I deal with this matter. Let's not do that. Why am I saying that? Because the world is really filled with confusion. And uh, the world needs not another administration in America. We, you know, we, we, we agree that, the, that in America, we, the president is the most powerful man in the world, especially since we are probably the only real superpower in the world today. But we don't need another administration. And some of you would disagree. What we need is the church to be the church. That's the answer. Now, if you are still, go ahead. If you are still entangled with the other things, then that is, that's another problem you have. Jesus can untangle you. Paul tells us that no one, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. And I know the arguments. I've, I've studied them all of my life, but no one who is engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Why? So that you may please the one who enlisted you as a soldier. That's what Paul, and so I am, I am radical. I know you probably say, well, Don Lavelle, you are radical. Yes, I am. I make no apologies about it, but I'm a good radical, I'm not a bad radical. I'm radically saved. I'm radically in love with Jesus Christ. I radically believe him. I believe he is the only solution for our problems. Yes, I do. I believe he is the answer, the only answer to our questions. I believe, yes, I believe, yes. Yes, I believe. And I also believe he is the unique son of God. Yes, I believe that because there's a witness in me. And my witness, witness, I didn't give it to myself. I didn't go out and find something. This witness found me. I'm walking in a backslidden condition, walking away from God after, after having learned a, a, a few things in the university and begin to ask the same dumb questions that were being asked and I'm not trying to degrade the university, but, but it's all, but I, the dumb question is, if there's a God, then why? You know, and so, and so we began to ask this question, walking in the wrong direction, and God, just as I prayed earlier, he stood in my path as I was walking in the wrong direction, says, this is it. You, you're not going around me. You got to come through me. And I fell into his arms, and, 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 the, and the rest is history. So what am I saying to you today? I'm saying that that, that witness now lives inside me. Uh, Jesus lives inside us through his spirit. And if you and I would just take a little time and get to know him, then he will change our thinking. He will change our doing. He will change all the stuff that we have made a peace treaty with and we have laid hold of. He will change it, he will remove it because Jesus Christ is the solution that the world needs. He is the desire of all nations, whether they know it or not. And the answer is locked up inside of us. I think we ought to come out of the closet. Everybody else is. Paul is amazing. I write him. I used to read the Bible when I was younger. 
I read the Bible, and I, would I talk when I read the Bible. You talk? I, I talk sometimes. I just talk to myself, and I, I used to say, you know, you know, God, I don't think I'd like this guy, Paul. I don't think I'd like this guy, Paul. And, and the more the, the, I grew and I came into learning <laughs> some understanding, I'd say, I really like this guy, Paul. <laughs> Because you know? somebody said a, a, a fanatic is somebody who is a greater fan than you are. And so I, I really love Paul's heart. He's, he's telling them he is an example of what it means to be a Christian. And that is my heart. I want to be an example of what it means to be a Christian. And Paul goes on to say, uh, you have us as a pattern for many walk. I, I, I think about this and I'm, I'm so amazed for many walk of whom I have told you often. Now, what he's saying is that so often we look for a crowd, uh, but God is looking for a congregation. And uh, we look for a crowd. And I, I love the crowd because my dad taught me when I was a young, young preacher. He said, I, I had an issue and I went to my dad and he says, son, you want more people so that you can help more people. And I never forgot that word in that I'm grateful for the crowd, but I want the crowd to become the congregation of the Lord. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. That, 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 that scripture pierces my heart. They are enemies. How are they enemies? He is not talking about people out there in the world that so, so many of us are distracted with. He's not talking about them. He's talking about us. We're the ones who have the answer. We're the only people on the face of the earth I've ever heard that said somebody is living inside of them. So, but it says they're enemies of the cross. Why are they enemies of the cross? Because they think it's Jesus and something else. They think it's the cross and something else. They have a yes, but attitude. But I offer to you one solution. God only offered us one solution. Well, what's wrong with one solution? How is it? How dare one say you just don't understand? We have been trying our way for 6,000 years. In America, we've been trying it since the 1700s, and we've not really gotten it right. You say, well, comparatively speaking, we have. I want to compare this with heaven then. Compare it. Come on, be, let's be honest about it. I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to charge us to come out of our comfort level and to do what God has commanded us to do. Listen, God sent his son. I mean, God sent his son. And you fathers out here, God sent his son. You mothers, God sent his son. God sent his son. I have one son, one son. The idea of sending him for people who don't like me, people who have rebelled and are treasonous, people who have made objects their God, and I'm going to love them so much that I send my son, and I know they will kill him like, they, like they've killed everything else. And I know he'll die a cruel death. And I know that I will have to break, as it were, fellowship with him. And I'll have to let him tread the wine press alone. And when he's crying out to me from that cross, I won't rescue him. I won't pull him down. That's our God. That's why the scripture says so aptly, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's a cornerstone verse if there ever was one in the Bible. God loves us. And Paul says there are people who are enemies of the cross. They're enemies of the cross because they don't give the cross its value. They don't give the cross its value. They don't, they don't live a, a cross-centered life. You see, the cross is demanding. It demands everything from you. It demands your very life. We trust you were blessed as you viewed today's broadcast. If you have enjoyed it, please call to write and let us know. You may own this message in its entirety by requesting the reference number as shown on your screen. Corpus Christi Christian Fellowship, demonstrating the love and compassion of Jesus Christ.
Welcome to Fellowship News. I'm Susan Liberto, Missions Director here at Corpus Christi Christian Fellowship and also Missions Director for the Fellowship International. We have with us today Pastor Donald Lavelle. Uh, he is the Senior Pastor at Corpus Christi Christian Fellowship and founder of the Fellowship International, which is a work exploding all over the world. Uh, we're going to talk to you today some, Pastor, I, I want you to tell us about how we're just seeing this work explode. We began in the Philippines and God's really establishing us, us there, but it's just exploding everywhere. You know, the Bible tells us that, uh, that there's something called the key of David. And it is, Jesus has the key of David. Jesus is the son of David uh, uh, after the flesh, after the natural means. And Jesus has this ability to open and no man can shut and to shut and no man can open. So what we have found is that he has placed before us an open door of ministry like I have never seen. So the Fellowship International is a ministry organized and designed to take the gospel of the kingdom, not just preaching, but the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom of God has come and that uh, the, the king has come, Jesus Christ, the very son of God who is our king. He has come and he has saved us from our sins. He has rescued us from our captivity. And we are preaching that message. And what we are finding is that everywhere we go, not in 80% of the places or 90% of the, of the places, that, those would be great statistics. But we are finding that in every place we're going, the doors are open wide. Wow. And I believe that no man can shut those doors because we are not preaching about things and we're not, we're not faddish, we're not using clever marketing strategies. Actually, um, it might would help us in some way to use some marketing, but we're not, we're not doing that. We're depending on God himself, on the Holy Spirit to open these doors. And we're finding that he is the most effective uh, one to help in ministry. So when in Asia, we found that in the Philippines, we have great and effectual open doors. Other Asian countries are opening up to us. We're getting invitations constantly mm -hmm. uh, to come and minister. It's like uh, Paul's vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. So we're in one place uh, in the Philippines and we're getting messages to go to other, or invitations rather, to come to mm -hmm. other Asian countries and preach the same gospel that we have been preaching in the Philippines. I think it's marvelous. It's, it's more than we can get to. Um, it's, you, we're really understanding the scripture that the laborers are few because you see the work is just so waiting for us. And I wanted to comment, um, you talked about the Lord opening doors and I want to hear what you would say it's because of the message. I think definitely. That he said, your message, that's the message I want. You're bringing it, so I'm opening the door. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, he told them to go and uh, teach all nations, you know, mm -hmm. to preach the gospel to all nations, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and then I'm with you. Now, Jesus commanded them to preach the gospel, the good news that God has sent his son. John 3.16 is often used, uh, but I think it is never overused that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in the son of God, Jesus Christ, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then, then the Bible says that for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus, through him, Christ, might be saved. That is the, the crux. That is everything that the gospel is about. And God didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. And we are preaching that message. And that message and that life that we are preaching and demonstrating is in his son. That life is in his son. And so what we, what we are finding is that God is pleased. How do we know God is pleased? The psalmist said, by this I know that God is pleased with me. My enemies don't triumph over me. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is that by this, we also know that that old serpent, the devil, that uh, satanic being, Satan himself, that is not triumphing over us. 
and, uh, and that God is open, opening doors and there's nothing the devil can do about it. There's nothing he has been able to do about it. And so we're excited about this message. We believe that it is the gospel of the kingdom and we want everybody in America, uh, those in our audience here to hear it, don't gravitate to places that, that and I'm not against any, any church at all. I'm not against any uh, God-inspired church. But we don't go to a place because we like the music or we go to a place because we like the decor. Uh, we go to a place because there are people our age or our race or our nationality. We go to a place where the gospel is preached and where the hand of God is upon it where there are blessings untold. And we are finding that we have invitations throughout Asia. We are now getting invitations throughout Europe. We're getting a, uh, invitations throughout Africa. Mm -hmm. And we are like the disciples when Jesus performed this great miracle of fish and Peter and, J and Andrew caught so many fish they could not, their nets were breaking, they could not haul all the fish in. They called their partners to help them. And James and John came over to help them. That's what we are seeing. and. Uh, I do agree it's because of the message and so the Fellowship International is now uh, throughout uh, we're actually entering Africa the African continent and we have many 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 nations in Africa that are saying come and do the same thing uh, with us and in us that you've done in the Philippines. And we're having now an invitation to Europe. We've had invitations to Europe, but now I think we're going into Europe in a stronger way. And I'm looking to do that in Canada and to launch our ministry in Mexico, throughout uh, Central America, and even in the South America and in Australia, so that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our wonderful King, will come back and get us and come back and see us. Amen. Hastening the day of Hastening His coming. Uh, it's, we're sharing the gospel of Christ and the doors are wide open. It's God's work. Um, join us again and we'll talk to you more about this work in the world. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.